A professor of philosophy at the State University of New York at Fredonia from 2000 to 2018, Dale Tuggy is a specialist in analytic theology and philosophy of religion. Tuggy holds a PhD in philosophy from Brown University, a master's in philosophy from Claremont, and a bachelor's in philosophy from Biola. He has published widely on the topic of the doctrine of the Trinity and Christology, and is the author of the book, What is the Trinity? And the co-author of, Is Jesus Human and Not Divine? He is most well known as the creator of his Trinity's podcast and blog, which features hundreds of episodes and posts on topics related to competing views about the Trinity, the history of theology, and Unitarian theology and Christology. He lives with his wife, Candace, who is here, and their children in Middle Tennessee, and he serves as the chair of the volunteer board of the Unitarian Christian Alliance. Dale Tuggy. Thank you, Mark. Wow, what a beautiful group of people. I can't believe it. Seeing this makes me think the Reformation is not dead. It's very encouraging. Uh, before I get started, I just wanted to give a shout out to the volunteer board of the UCA, which has put a ton of work uh, in making this conference happen over the last months. Um, and also the volunteers that are with us today, uh, but especially our conference partners, namely Living Hope International Ministries, Atlanta Bible College, Spirit and Truth, Allegiance to the King, the Williamsburg Christadelphian Foundation, IntegritySyndicate.com, and the 21st Century Reformation Online. Uh, thanks so much for your support and help and uh, in your, your assistance in this great cause of truth. All right. So my talk tonight is called What John 1 Meant. And, you know, Trinitarian traditions have passed on what I call the canon within the canon. And this is a small subset of scriptures which are viewed as supporting creedal orthodoxy in the Trinity and Incarnation. And the very crown jewel in the canon within the canon is the introduction to the Gospel according to John. Pretty much every Unitarian Christian has had this question thrown at them with an air of incredulity, but what about John 1? The assumption is that the passage only makes sense if God is the Trinity, but that assumption, as I'll show, is without any justification. So before we go any further, I just want to read through the passage in the New Revised Standard Translation. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God it is God the only Son, or in other texts, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. Now, as far as I know, there have only ever been uh, four types of interpretation of this passage. 
And people have forgotten this nowadays, and this I, I blame the Bible scholars for this. They have just willfully forgotten that in Christian history, this is a much disputed text. And there have been very uh, different and clashing approaches to it. And the four basic types of interpretation, as I understand them, are these. I'm going to go backwards in time. Uh, there's what we call the Socinian interpretation, which as far as I can tell, only goes back to the 16th century. And they just interpret this as about Jesus's human life. So that in the beginning, they think that refers to like the beginning of his coming, the beginning of his ministry, the beginning of the gospel era. Then we have Trinitarian interpretations which, as far as I know, you only find in the second half of the 300s and later. And they think this is about two divine persons in God, one, both of which were involved in creation and one of which became flesh, whatever that means. Before you had any Trinitarian interpretations of John 1, you have what we now call subordinationists, second century and later. On this understanding, it's about God and also the second lesser God, or, quote, God, that God created through. And then there's what John actually meant. First century and later, it's about God's word by which he created, uh, which became flesh in the man Jesus. So what I want to do briefly now is just highlight how problematic the Trinity is for this text. They just don't go well together. My purpose is not to give a full refutation of a Trinitarian interpretation of this text, but just to point out that it bristles with difficulties at every turn. One of them that's really obvious is that theos in Greek normally refers to the Father. And so then if that's how you take it, you would start off the book of John by reading, in the beginning was the Son, and the Son was with the Father, and the Son was the Father. But that's not good. You don't, you don't want a son and father. I mean, there's differences between them, right? Okay, but if you say, no, we don't want to say, it, it, it's not saying the son was the father. Uh, we want to translate the word as God, word was God or theos ain't halagos in Greek. We want to translate that as the son is divine. So it's just, it's a predicating equality of the son saying that he's divine. Okay, but to be divine is to be a God. That's just what it means particularly in an ancient philosophical context. If the word is a God, seemingly he's not the same God as the one that he's with, right? Because one of them's the ultimate source of the world, and then this other one would be the next to last, the next to most ultimate source of the world. So it looks like he wouldn't be the same God, but that's just one too many gods, right? Verse 14, the word became flesh and lived among us. Becoming flesh here, I think most readers understand, is just a way of saying uh, was a man or became a man, like a human being, a human person. But uh, small c Catholic theologies, if you look really close at the fine print, they deny that Jesus was a human person. They say the eternal divine Son of God took on an anhypostatic human nature, which was not a human person. Okay, but it looks like it's talking about a human person just like you know the rest of the book. If, if this is about two divine persons, then only one will be the ultimate source of creation. So in that sense of creator, there'll only be one who is creator. But I thought the Father and Son are supposed to be equally divine. How can they be equally divine if only one of them is the creator in the biblical sense of being the ultimate source of the cosmos? There are some Old Testament passages we'll look at in a bit on which the, the God of the Old Testament, they're called Yahweh or same one who's called the Father in the New Testament. He just takes credit for creating on his own. He strongly pounds the table that no one else was helping him. This doesn't fit to say that there was this other one in the beginning uh, that was involved in his creation. Okay, and just to wrap this little, this little tour of difficulties up, this text neither states nor implies nor presupposes anything about a third divine person, the Holy Spirit, it doesn't say anything about a triune God. This is not mentioned anywhere. It doesn't tell us that the Son or the Word is a person within God. Right? Nothing even sounds like that. And it certainly doesn't tell us anything about divine processions, You know that the Father eternally generates the Logos, the Word, or that the Spirit eternally proceeds from the Father and, and the Word, things like that. Here's a crude analogy. 
Suppose that I told you that I have found a long lost historical painting of the famous medieval queen, Eleanor of Aquitaine. And then I show you this. Now, hold on. This is, <laughs> this look, first of all, it looks like a crudely photoshopped photograph, which is what it is. Uh, second of all, she seems to be holding an automatic shotgun and she appears to be wearing hunting camo, and I'm pretty sure they didn't have any of those things back then. So this is just a, a grotesque anachronism, right? These elements that I mentioned are centuries out of place. This cannot be an image from the lifetime of this medieval queen. Okay, well, the idea of a triune God is centuries out of place when we're talking about the gospel according to John which was written maybe towards the end of the first century. But there isn't anybody talking about a triune God, not only in the year 95, but not even in the year 195, not even in the year 295. It's only towards the 370s that you really have talk of a triune God coming onto the stage. Okay, but there were people in those earlier times who held the next type of interpretation that I wanna briefly talk about, which I call subordinationism. So long before anybody dreamed that there was a triune God on display here, um, at least by the middle of the 100s, people thought this was about God and then this some kind of lesser divine being, the Logos. So these interpretations agree with the later Trinitarian ones that the Son just is the Word, that those are the same person. So they think it's talking about, you know, uh, a preexistent divine being right at the beginning. And they agree that this being is in some sense divine, but these interpretations do not assert, imply, or assume that the one God is tripersonal. No, to the contrary, they assume that the one God is the Father. They don't assume or assert that the Word slash Son is fully divine. Divine in some sense, sure. Preexistent, yeah. But not having all the qualities of God. They don't say that the Word or Son is a person within God. Again, they just say what's at, at the beginning of all the ancient creeds, you know, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of the heavens and the earth. Oh, but they think when he created, he, he had to do it through this intermediary for some reason. And some of them assume that the Son is not eternal. Uh, they're divided about this. Some of them think God eternally generates this Logos, which is his Son. And some of them think, no, when it's time to create, then God finally brings the sun into being. One way you can visualize their interpretation is just to point out that they think two different gods are mentioned. So when it says the word was with God, okay, he's with God, that's the Almighty. Um, and the word was, you could translate a God, or you could just translate God, but they think it's referring to another, right? Even names can be ambiguous. There's at least one more Dale Tuggy in the world last time I checked, believe it or not. Even proper names, right, it, the name is ambiguous. It can refer to this person or that person. So they just think that the word theos here is, is referring to God and then to somebody else. A little strange, admittedly, to change meanings in mid-sentence like that, but I guess it's possible. Or maybe they want to say, um, no, it's not being used like a name or title. It's just saying that the word was divine. Okay, but to be divine is to be a god, so then there still would be two divine beings that you're talking about here. Now, when this subordinationist reading started to be propounded, as far as we know, starting with Justin Martyr in the middle of the 100s, people reacted strongly against it. They said, wait a second, what are you saying there, guys? Are you saying that we preach two gods or two creators? I thought there was only one god and one creator. So where are you getting this two gods and two creators business? And we know that people reacted against it because the, one, the ones that uh, historians call logos theorists, the very people pushing this to God's interpretation, those very people complain about ordinary Christians who don't buy it and say, we don't like this to God and to creator stuff. So people like Origen and Tertullian and Novation tell us this. That's why we know that this theory was considered to be new in the middle and last part of the 100s and that it was also widely opposed. And the opposition to this kind of understanding goes deep into the 200s and even is found beyond in some cases. 
So the people pushing back would say, no, we think there's only one God mentioned. We think the second God mentioned is really the same as the first God. So the word was with God and the word was God. So say around the year 200, the options for interpreting John 1 uh, are pretty limited, and there's about four of them, and they go hand in hand with what were four mainstream Christian theologies at the time. So I'm not even talking about the Gnostics. I'm talking about people who accepted something resembling our New Testament canon, uh, who were considered mainstream and who accepted the gospel according to John. If you just ask a question, if you ask two questions, I think you can sort these views. Right? So this was the state of art. This was the state of the art for orthodoxy circa 200 AD. Okay? And the Trinitarianism doesn't come into it. It wasn't a thing then. If you ask, is the word the same God as mentioned before? You can say yes or no. Suppose it is the same God that's mentioned before. The next question is, but do you think the word is the son? Right? We know there's a human son mentioned at the end of the passage, and that's what the whole book is about, right? Jesus, the son of Mary. Uh, we know that's the son of God. Um, is the word the same person as that, but just like before he was a human? So if you say yes to that, then you're what historians call a modalist or an ancient modalistic monarchian. You think the father just is the son. The son will be something like just a manifestation or personality of the father or something like that. And, you know, I think this is a pretty terrible option. The Bible authors are very clear to keep apart God and the Son of God. They don't run together the Father and the Son like that. Okay, if you say the Word is the same God as mentioned before, but the Word is not the Son, presumably the Word is going to be something like a divine attribute or a divine action. And the Son will be the man that we know and love from the rest of the Gospel. And that's another kind of monarchian, people who said, hey, we uphold the monarchy of the Father. We're not going to go for this two gods stuff, this two creator stuff. Nowadays, we call them biblical Unitarians. Yes, we know they were around in the 100s and 200s. They were pushing back against this theory of two gods. Uh, if you say it's not the same God as mentioned before, okay, so when you say the word was with God, you've mentioned one, quote, God, um, and the word was God, now you're mentioning another one. Okay, those are the other two interpretations. We can then ask, is the word the son? Are those supposed to be one and the same? Are they supposed to be the same person? If we say yes, you get a Logos theory where preexistent divine word has then taken on a body, and that's Jesus. So then Jesus ends up being a divine person with a body. If you say no, the word is not the son, those are different, they're not the same person, then you get a word man Logos theory. And believe it or not, this was popular. This is what Origen and Tertullian thought, who were considered leading lights of mainstream Christianity in the early 200s. Okay, so they do believe in a human Jesus, but they also believe in this preexistent divine word. Well, that looks like it's one son too many, right? So let's see, it later gets decried as Nestorianism, but it seems like a pretty terrible way to interpret the New Testament. If these are our four options, I think there are strong reasons to rule out three of them, right? The Jesus of the New Testament is always presupposed to be a real man, a human person, not a merely apparent human person, not an angel, not a divine person in disguise, right? So then you, you can't have docetism. Docetism is a view where uh, Jesus appears to be a human but isn't really a human. He just appears to be a human, right? So you should rule those out. And uh, the word man Christology, that has a human Jesus, but it also has another son too, which is a total disaster. You know, the Son of God and Jesus and Jesus Christ, those are all three, three names for the same guy in the New Testament, right? They're not two different guys. That's what some of the crazy Gnostics thought, but I don't think that's a view that should be taken seriously, that, oh, there's the Son of God and there's also Jesus. That won't work. Where's the Trinitarian option? It didn't exist at this time. Like these were all people within the bishop led, you know, sometimes scholars call it proto orthodoxy today. So I, I mean, I think there's strong reasons to rule out three of those four. Right? If you're trying to interpret John 1, Trinitarianism is just a total anachronism, it's centuries out of place. 
the subordinationist view, uh, I think, has pretty desperate theological problems, and it's hard to square with the rest of the New Testament and Old Testament, and you'll see more about why I think that. But I want to say a few words about the Socinian interpretation. Um, again, this is based on the I, uh, it's based on the fact that arche, the word we translate as beginning in the New Testament, very often can mean like the beginning of the Christian era, the beginning of Jesus's public ministry, and that kind of thing. And I mean, I think it was a reaction against you know Trinitarian traditions, which didn't have a truly human Jesus. They're like, no, it's all about the human Jesus. Um, and we do know also that there is a theme of new creation in Paul. And so if beginning could mean like the beginning of Jesus's ministry, and we know that early Christians talked about Jesus as being involved in a creation, not the Genesis creation, but the re recreation of all things in some sense, uh, maybe it's talking about that creation. Um, I'm not going to uh, interact more with this view. There's a lot more that could be said for it, but I want to spend most of my time talking about what I think the right answer is, like what John would have meant to its original audience. So I just want to say a couple of things that I think are unfortunate about this. One is that almost all readers, when they see, when they see NRK in the beginning and then talk about all things uh, coming to be, they think it's about the Genesis creation. And they see a sequence of time going through uh, from the time of creation until the post-resurrection, post right? At the end, he's like celebrating like how, how great, you know, Jesus's ministry was and how we're in such a great position now. Um, and I have on the handout, uh, if you want to look at where I mark them, I think there's five different times mentioned. And the Socinian interpretation denies that. It's going to have fewer times and uh, it does bother me that, as best we can tell, nobody held this in ancient times. Now, if this is what John 1 meant, and if John was a competent communicator, and God was a competent revealer, <laughs> there would have been people running around who understood John 1 in this way in ancient times. And as far as we know, as far as I know, there's no evidence for that. And there, there should be some evidence if there were people like that. Now. This could change tomorrow. You know, we could discover some long lost manuscript and we could find somebody taking the interpretation uh, in this, of John 1 in the Socinian way tomorrow. And then I would have to take this back. But it does, it does bother me that it seems to be an early modern thing. Um, in contrast, we do know ancient people, people in the 100s, who held to the subordinationist type of interpretation. And we have good reason to think that the dynamic monarchians held to a view like the one that I'm going to explain, on which the word isn't a person. Uh, it's something less than a person, but it gets expressed in the man Jesus. So again, that's not an absolute refutation of the Socinian view. Uh, it's just a couple of problems, but uh, I want to spend more time uh, explaining in rather gruesome detail why I think the fourth view is right. Now, about popularity, what, what do most scholars say, right? If that's as far as you're going to take it, then the Trinitarian interpretation has been dominant since the late 300s, or roundabouts there. But, you know, sometimes the majority's wrong. And uh, if you had just done that maneuver a little bit earlier, say in the year 250, at least if you were among certain elite you know, thinkers like Origen, then the majority of those type of people would have been subordinationists. They would say, hey, you've got the one true God, and then you've also got this lesser divine being, God's logos. Oh, and there's this man too, he's, he's pretty cool. Uh, right, so just going with a majority would have led you wrong in those times, if you're a Trinitarian, right? And so it's a risky move to do that, to do that now. Uh, what I'm going to call the correct reading was probably popular widely before mid to late 200s. And you can even find pockets of people who seem to accept this in the 300s. And among Unitarian Christians, uh, it's been a popular view since the 1700s. One interesting fact is the kind of understanding of John 1 that I'm going to explain to you has been repeatedly and sometimes independently rediscovered by modern Bible scholars. 
So you have really great towering leading scholars like Nathaniel Lardner discovering this view for himself. But then you have people like J.A.T. Robinson, the leading John scholar, discover it. And as far as I can tell, he hadn't read any of the, the earlier Unitarian scholars. So in yellow, I have the names of Unitarian writers. They're all reading each other. The later ones read the earlier ones. Another great scholar among them is Andrews Norton from Harvard. He has a lot to say about this. Robinson discovers it for himself. Uh, James Dunn, who died recently, uh, almost comes to this view, seemingly on his own without having read the earlier Unitarian material. And a leading Talmudic scholar, Daniel Boyarin, has come to this sort of view. He, now he's reading Dunn. But now it is a little suspicious that not just scholars, but like really top level scholars are coming back to this view, um, even in some cases when it's not in their interest to do so. That doesn't prove anything, but it's interesting. So James Dunn, a lot of people are familiar with his famous book, Christology in the Making. And he comes to a very uh, strange interpretation of this passage. He says, it's only with verse 14, the word became flesh and lived among us. He says that we can begin to speak of a personal logos Prior to verse 14, we are in the same realm as pre-Christian talk of wisdom and logos, same traditional ideas that we find in the wisdom tradition and in Philo of Alexandria, who lived roughly in the time of Jesus, where we're dealing with personifications rather than persons, personified actions of God rather than an individual divine being as such. Right, what he just said is John 1, 1 through 13 doesn't have to do with a pre-existent divine person in addition to the Father. It just has to do with God's eternal word slash wisdom uh, by which he made all things. Well, that's, that's pretty radical. And as a Trinitarian, that was not in his interest to say that. Now he, he takes it all back because uh, he says in verse 14, this word, which is an action of God, literally becomes flesh like a human being, which, you know, I think that's nonsense. An action can't turn into a person. That that's, it's just a non-starter. Like it doesn't make, it takes John to be saying something plainly impossible. And if, as he says, prior to verse 14, nothing has been said, which would be strange to an Hellenistic Jew, or a Jew of John's time who's reading Greek, Greek language literature, if they're not saying anything that guy couldn't accept prior to verse 14, why would you think something super brand new is being said in 14 and following? Like, maybe the rest of it would have made sense to him too. Why not just go with that? A lot of scholars, including James Dunn, they have a really hard time letting go of two uh, presuppositions, two, two popular assumptions in particular. And one is that the word is the same self as the man Jesus. It's just Jesus like before his human career. Well, it doesn't say that anywhere. No, it doesn't say it in verse 14. It's just a presupposition that people bring to the text. They also assume that Christian theology stands or falls with the doctrine of incarnation, of an eternal divine person within God who becomes flesh in the very peculiar sense of entering into a mysterious union with an impersonal, complete human nature, which is a body and soul. Is that really what Christian theology stands or falls with? If that were true, I'd expect to hear a lot more about that in the New Testament than I do. But look, you should question that the word is supposed to be the same self as Jesus. And we ought to ask, why would John grandiosely call Jesus the word and then drop that unique title for the whole rest of the book? Because if you look in the whole rest of the book, he doesn't call Jesus the word. He calls him a lot of other amazing things, the way, the truth, the life, I am the resurrection and the life, right? Why not just say, I am the word of God? Well, it's because he doesn't want you to confuse Jesus, who is a real person, with the personification, which is the word, uh, back in the beginning. Uh, think about how they personify Lady Wisdom, which I'll show you a lot more about in a second. You know, the Lady Wisdom's calling on the streets, you know, you should get me, I'm more valuable than gold or silver. Suppose he gets to 31, he wants to write about the Proverbs 31 woman, and he wants to mention his actual wife, Jennifer. Well... He better not call her wisdom after all that, right? Because that would make you think she's the same person as that personification of God's wisdom that's shouting on the street corner and everything. That would just confuse everybody. 
Right? Even though she's wise, and she might be so wise you could call her wisdom embodied or something. No, you don't want to do that if you've just made a big deal about this personification. So Logos is used 36 times after the prologue, and it never means Jesus or a divine person. That's not controversial. It typically means things like message, right? So Jesus prays to God in chapter 17, sanctify them in the truth, your Logos is truth. And uh, among the Samaritans, it says many more believed because of his Logos, his message. Now, if the word became flesh and lived among us as Jesus, which is a way of saying that he's the greatest embodiment of God's word slash wisdom, then it'd be appropriate to call Jesus the word of God, right? Because the word of God is in him. Or you call him life because he's the source of life. You call him the way because his, his, you know, he's showing us the way to uh, reconciliation with God. And the author of Revelation does say that his name is called the Word of God in one of his visions, which, again, there's nothing wrong with it. So it's, I think it's telling that John doesn't do that. My main points in this talk are really two. The first point is that Trinitarian confidence in this famous passage, that it only makes sense, given their fourth century and later speculations about God and Jesus, that confidence is completely misplaced. Second, there is a well-motivated and plausible way to understand this text in light of writings that the original audience would have had access to, whether books of the Old Testament, books of what we now call intertestamental literature, or even the books of the New Testament. Now, being fairly old as internet users go, I couldn't help but be reminded of a certain meme that was popular in the early 2000s. And uh, some of you maybe will remember this. And uh, if you laugh at this, you're probably endured. This is based on a bad English translation of a Japanese video game from the 90s. What happened? Someone set up us the bug. We get signal. What? Main screen turn on. It's you. How are you gentlemen? All your base are belong to us. You are on the way to destruction. What you say? You have no chance to survive make your time. Ha ha ha. Okay, I think you get the idea. So, my dear Trinitarian friends, when it comes to John 1, all your verse are belong to us. You are on the way to destruction. You have no chance to survive, make your time. Ha, ha, ha. Someone set up us the bomb. The bomb that was set up for Trinitarian interpretations of John 1 is the modern discovery of the wisdom theme in New Testament Christology generally and specifically in the prologue. And this has been going on for a long time. And in, in the whole rest of this talk, I'm not telling you anything that's the slightest bit original. And there are a few Bible scholars who know all of these things that I'm going to tell you. But strangely, they just compartmentalize and manage to hold these things in their mind with a Trinitarian way of looking at John 1. So these are some of the many books I consulted by many leading scholars. Evans' Word and Glory is particularly good, Dunn's Christology in the Making, Boyarin's Borderlines, etc. What I'm going to show is that all of the prologue would have been intelligible, it would have been understandable to the original first century audience in light of previous or contemporary writings and that no anachronistic ideas such as second century Logos theory or fourth century speculations about multiple persons in God are needed to understand this text. So what I've done for the rest of this presentation is to divide up the passage into various themes. And this is on the latter half of the handout that's in your folder. Uh, and I wanna show for each theme 
that the original audience could have hearkened back to something they had read before about it. And so I've got the, uh, the previous uh, and contemporary passages color-coded to match that part of the prologue. So here's the first theme, verses 1 and 2. Someone with God in the beginning, oh, it's really just him. Right? The obvious text here in the Bible is Proverbs 8. When God prepared the heaven, I, this is Lady Wisdom talking, was with him. When he strengthened the foundations of the earth, I was by him. I rejoiced in his presence continually. Wisdom of Solomon is a book much like Proverbs. It was written in Greek, probably in the first century B.C. He writes, With you is wisdom, she who knows your works, and was present when you made the world. Uh, just before, give me the wisdom that sits by your throne. Okay, so it's personification. Wisdom is with God when he makes the world. Here it says God created wisdom. He poured her out upon all his works. This is Lady Wisdom talking. I came forth from the mouth of the Most High and covered the earth like a mist. Okay, wisdom is saying she came forth from the mouth of God. That makes her God's word. This book, Sirach, uh, probably has the most and the most compelling uh, parallels to John 1. Uh, if you look in Catholic or Orthodox Bibles, you'll find this book in the middle. Sometimes it's called Ecclesiasticus, or the Wisdom of Jesus, son of Sirach. And it was written in Hebrew, they think, between 200 and 180 B.C. And it was read widely in Greek in the first century, in, in Greek and other translations. And uh, so it's, it's taking what's in Proverbs and sort of pushing it a step fa farther. And this is the first of many examples you'll see where they kind, of, they kind of meld together the personified characters of God's wisdom and God's word. And that's why I think Logos and John, John 1, it kind of means both of those things. Okay, personifications, right? Wisdom cries out in the street, how long, O oh simple ones, will you love being simple? Proverbs 4, do not forsake her and she will keep you. Love her and she will guard you. She will bestow on you a beautiful crown. In the wisdom of Solomon, this later than the Old Testament book, Solomon says, I loved her and sought her from my youth. I desired to take her for my bride and became enamored of her beauty. Now, who is this lucky lady? Well, it's not anybody. It's a personification of a divine attribute. So the excellent evangelical scholar Ben Witherington writes, it's clear that the sages, he's talking about between the Testaments here, Jewish writers, the sages are not dealing with a person and certainly not with a goddess, but with the personification of an idea, concept, attribute, or quality that was seen as desirable for humans to obtain and was already something that characterized God and God's orderly creation. So God has it within him. He puts it in the world. It's available for us to get to. That's wisdom. Now, some people say, come on, uh, isn't the word a God? Right? It says theos ain halagos in Greek. It doesn't use the word the before the word God. And some authors like Philo and Origen uh, have made a big deal that if you put the word the before theos, ha theos in Greek, that's God. That's God Almighty. But if you don't put it, you know, it could be translated in some context as a God. Then you're clearly talking about some lesser divine being. Um, well, that might be how some of those guys want to use the terminology, like this is in Origen's commentary on John, but that's not how the fourth gospel uses those terms. And this is discussed in a famous monograph by an evangelical scholar called Jesus as God. Um, and he points out that in, in the fourth gospel, theos, the word God, appears 83 times, 63 times with the the, so literally the God, and 20 times just theos without the the. And he says several facts make it highly improbable that John intends any consistent distinction between ha theos and theos, as if between father and son. And I'm not going to go into what those are. The grammar nerds can look that up. Uh, aside from a few exceptions, he says, Theos or ha theos equally will refer to the Father. And I think he's mistaken about some of his exceptions. I mean, I think it's the Father that's meant in John 1. I think he's misreading 118 with the wrong text. Um, and I think at the end, 
when Thomas says, my Lord and my God, he's confessing both the Lord Jesus and the God Almighty who's at work in him. So really, um, theos always means the Father in John, and the only time it doesn't is when it's used in a plural form. Those are called gods to whom the word of God came when Jesus is in this argument with some of his critics. Okay, this word is not an unfamiliar character. This is not something we've never heard of before if we're Jews in that time or if you're just a Bible reader today. There are really obvious personifications of God's word, right? His word runs swiftly. Uh, it shall accomplish that which I purpose. Famous passage in the Wisdom of Solomon is talking about the night in which God cursed Egypt by killing the firstborn children of, of all the houses of Egypt. Your all-powerful word leaped down from heaven, a stern warrior carrying the sharp sword of your authentic command, and stood and filled all things with death and touched heaven while standing on earth. Okay, but it's just, it's just God's word. It's not his assassin who's somebody else. It's just God declared that it should be done. Now, what about this whole idea of God creating through another? Well, the door is open to this sort of talk and this sort of speculation by the opening of the Bible, right? When God creates by speaking, God said, let there be light, and there was light. There's only one creator, but how do we get to, be, get to talk about something, somebody else creating? Well, Psalm 33, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all their hosts by the breath of his mouth. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. Let them praise the name of the Lord, Psalm 148, for he commanded and they were created. All right, so to command and then they end up being created, that's just the same as to create by your word, right? It's just putting it two different ways. Dead Sea Scrolls, all, come, all things come to pass by his knowledge. He establishes all things by his design and without him nothing is done, him being God's knowledge. Proverbs 3. The Lord by wisdom founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. By his knowledge, the deeps broke open and the clouds dropped dew. Similar passage in Jeremiah 10. It is he who made the earth by his power, who established the world by his wisdom and by his understanding stretched out the heavens. Jeremiah does not mean that there were three agents in addition to God who were involved in this work. It's just God. God created, and this action reflects at least three of his attributes, right? The only agent here is God. This is just basic reading comprehension. Okay, wisdom of Solomon, by your word and by your wisdom you have formed humankind, right? It's just going from one to the other. Give me the wisdom that sits by your throne. Okay, now we've taken a step. We're not, we're not only talking about God creating by his word or by his wisdom, same thing in the writer's mind. Uh, but now it's a somebody, but it's, it's a pseudo somebody. It's personification. It's talking about a non-person as if it's a person. Leading scholar Craig Keener writes, the Old Testament had personified wisdom and ancient Judaism eventually identified, sort of collapsed together into one character, personified wisdom, the word of God and the law or the Torah. Developing Old Testament ideas, he writes, Jewish teachers have emphasized that God had created all things through his word, wisdom slash word slash law. A leading John scholar, Marianne May Thompson, has some very interesting things to say when she's not in Trinitarian mode. She says, the Old Testament word of the Lord comes from God and is the means of God's creation and revelation. It is never separable from the identity of God. In other words, it's not someone else. Yet at the same time, it can be spoken of as an active subject. The word is both with God and is God. Much the same can be predicated of the figure of wisdom. Right? You can even take this this way of describing God's creation so far that you call wisdom herself the fashioner of all things, right? So you've gone from talking about making things through her, now she's the creator somehow. Yeah, but it's really just God, right? Whatever wisdom does, that's just what God does. Now about God creating through another, I mean, perhaps it should go without saying, but texts like these are not telling us that God had some help in creating. At most, they're just personifying an attribute of God like wisdom or reason or understanding or knowledge. And I think we should 
remember that a few texts assert that only one person, God himself, was involved in creation. Right? So this should be a motive to not think that there are more than one involved in creation. Isaiah 45, I made the earth and created humankind upon it. It was my hands that stretched out the heavens, and I commanded all their hosts. This is how a natural language like Hebrew or Greek tells you that there was one person involved. It uses singular personal pronouns, and it uses singular verb forms. Uh, Another chapter in Isaiah 44, I am Yahweh who made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who by myself spread out the earth. He's just pounding the table, right? And so again, singular personal pronoun. Now you have a personal name, Yahweh. That's the name of a person. Right, verb, the verb tenses, it all tells you. And not only that, he says he did it by himself, right? Like, how could you more strongly say that I did this only just me, the Father? There isn't a stronger way to say it. And if he just wanted to exclude the alleged gods of the nations out of it, he could just say, well, none of those characters had any hand in this. It was me and my crew, not those guys. Fooey on those guys. Right, but you wouldn't say all the I myself, it was only my hands and things like that. And, uh, you know, people who love to uh, speculate about God said, let us make humankind in our image. And they're like, well, who is the us? Is it the Trinity? Is, you know, what's going on there? Well, when it actually gets to the creating part, it says God created humankind in his image. He created them. Male and female, he created them. That's how it tells you that he did it himself. So, you know, sometimes people say, let's do something, and they do it themselves, right? Hanging out at Thanksgiving, Grandma says, hey, I don't know, let's make some pie. You're like, that's a great idea, Grandma, let's make some pie. And then she makes the pie, and you watch football. (laughs) Thank God for grandmas. Okay, another... Another thing to keep in mind, all clear New Testament texts that are not disputed, where allegedly it's getting Jesus involved somehow, all the clear undisputed texts about the Genesis creation presuppose that there was only one involved. It's just God, the Father. Okay, well, when you consider facts like this, you go back to John 1, and it mentions this word through whom all things were made, not one thing was made without him. Well, I think you should conclude what the great early modern Unitarian scholar Nathaniel Lardner concludes. He writes, Who should this be but God the Father, the one living and true God, and author of life and all being? Are there more creators than one? Would any Jew or disciple of Jesus ascribe the creation of the world to any but God? Or his reason or understanding or discretion, his wisdom, his power, his word, his spirit, which is the same as God himself? I mean, it kind of doesn't matter how you say it. There's a lot of roundabout ways of saying that God created the world. You just mention him by way of mentioning one of his attributes. Uh, If you don't know who Nathaniel Lardner is, he's one of the all-time great uh, patristic scholars, um, who uh, also a great apologist uh, for the Christian faith, and a Unitarian. Okay, verses 3 and 4. God's word or wisdom as source of life. Proverbs, Lady Wisdom says, whoever finds me finds life. Whoever loves her loves life, writes Sirach. Psalm 119, revive me, and this is the Greek translation, revive me according to your logos. Give me life, O Lord, according to your logos. And this is a theme that you see later in John, right? Peter says to him, you have the words of eternal life. And he says, whoever does not love me does not keep my words, but the word that you hear is not mine, but is from the Father who sent me. God's word is in Jesus. That's what is actually being said in John 1. I also think this fits together, this reading that I'm suggesting, with what we find in 1 John 1. Just briefly, the way I understand it is, he says, We declare to you what was from the beginning, that is, when God created, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands in our time with Jesus, concerning the word of life, this life, in other words, God's word, was revealed, and we have seen it and testify to it, that is, the life or God's word, and declare to you the eternal life, that is, the word that was with the Father and was revealed to us. 
we declare to you that we have what we have seen and heard, so you may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So it looks like he's pointedly not personifying the word. He's talking about it in impersonal terms. And he's clarifying that, yes, we do have fellowship with two, but it's not God and his word. It's God and his human son, Jesus the Christ. Continuing with the theme of God's word or wisdom as source of light. Genesis 1, God said, Psalm 36, for with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. The unfolding of your word gives light. Psalm 119. Wisdom of Solomon, she, wisdom, is a breath of the power of God and a pure emanation of the glory of the Almighty, for she is a reflection of eternal light, etc. Philo, in one of his writings, again, he's about contemporary with Jesus, a very Hellenized Jewish interpreter. Uh, he mentions uh, God's most perfect word, the light. Uh, you have an association between word and light in one of the Targums, uh, there's a famous passage called the homily on the four nights and the four nights are creation uh, the night when God made his promise to Abraham the night uh, of the death of the Egyptian firstborn and the fourth night that it comments on is the coming of the Messiah later in John right if you have God's word which is light in you you can be called a light yourself and so it calls John the Baptist who is a true prophet a burning and shining lamp but Jesus gets to be something a lot more than that, right? I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Baruch, written in Hebrew sometime between 200 BC and 60 BC, all who hold her, God's knowledge or his Torah, all who hold her fast will live, and those who forsake her will die. Turn, O Jacob, and take her, walk toward the shining of her light. So again, you have God's word or wisdom as source of life and light. You see this in a very interesting passage also in John 12. Uh, whoever believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me uh, sees him who sent me. Not literally, of course, but in your understanding. He says, I have come as light into the world so that everyone who believes in me should not remain in darkness. I do not judge anyone who hears my words and does not keep them. For I came not to judge the world, but to save it. Now watch this. He's going to personify God's word, but it goes by kind of fast. This is Jesus himself in John personifying God's word. He says, the one who rejects me and does not receive my logos, my word, has a judge. On the last day, the logos that I have spoken will serve as judge. For I have not spoken on my own, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment about what to say and what to speak. I know that his commandment is eternal life. All right, so God's word is life. And you can personify it. You can call it a judge. Hey, I'm not going to judge you, but God's word is. Well, actually, Jesus is going to judge us, as we read later in the New Testament. Again, he's, he's playing around with personification. I am the resurrection and the life, he says. Uh, those who believe in me have eternal life. Jesus is life because God's word is in him, and it's God's word that's the source of life, right? So if we believe that word, we get the life from it ourselves. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life, he says in chapter 6. Another theme, verses 3 and 4, God's word or wisdom as source of life and light for all people. So Proverbs 8, she cries out, O people I call, and my cry is to all that live. Wisdom of Solomon has God's wisdom pervading all things, uh, particularly, you know, intelligent spirits. Again, John writes that the word is the light of all people in John 1. And it's a theme of this earlier wisdom literature that wisdom is available to all, as God has in some sense put wisdom in the whole world. Again, for all people... In Sirach, wisdom brags that I'm over all the earth and over every people and nation I have held sway. The Lord poured her out upon all his works. She is with all flesh, according to his gift. Uh, verse 5, light shines in darkness. Darkness doesn't overcome or maybe comprehend the light. Right? Against wisdom, evil does not prevail. You see this in the New Testament, right? These were books written before John, presumably. 
Jesus said, you are the light of the world to his disciples. Paul writes uh, that for once you Christians were in darkness, but now in the Lord you are light. Uh, you have Zechariah, father of John the Baptist, prophesying that by the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness. Okay, so I'm in verse 5 in the prologue. I'm going to skip verses 6 through 9. It's a little interlude that talks about John the Baptist, and it's setting him up as lesser than Jesus, right? His role is to be the the forerunner, the proclaimer, but it's Jesus who is the one that really makes the difference. God's word, yeah, comes to us in John because he is a true prophet of the one God, but God's word is embodied in Jesus, which makes him much greater than any mere prophet. So skipping to verse 10, God's word or wisdom is in the world. Wisdom 8, uh, they write, she reaches mightily from one end of the earth to the other, and she orders all things well. So in verse 10, he's done with his little interlude about John the Baptist, and then he goes back to continue the history of the career of God's word. That's how I understand it. So he talks about at the time of creation, then after creation, uh, and he's, he's back to that time here. Right? Lady Wisdom in Proverbs 1 says, I have called and you refuse, and I will laugh at your calamity. Sirach 24 over waves of the sea, over all the earth, and over every people and nation I have held sway. Among these I sought a resting place. In whose territory should I abide? Now this is an interesting theme in earlier Jewish literature of God's word trying to find somewhere to go. And sometimes uh, God's word gives up and goes home and takes all her marbles with her. Sometimes she lands in Israel and now it's the Torah. Um, but what... John says about it is interesting. He kind of has a middle position. All right, so in Sirach, uh, God says to wisdom, make your dwelling in Jacob and in Israel receive your inheritance, your inheritance. And she says, in the holy tent, I ministered before him. And so I was established in Zion. So here she finds a home. Baruch, uh, afterwards, she knowledge, God's knowledge appeared on earth and lived with humankind. Hmm. That sounds kind of like incarnation, doesn't it? But not a literal incarnation. Okay, but just because God's word comes down to earth, it doesn't mean that everyone accepts her. So you read in uh, Psalm 105, Our fathers in Egypt had no faith in his logos. They did not listen to the voice of the Lord. So as we know by experience, some people do accept God's word and other people reject God's word. And that's just, that's how it is. And this is the mediating position that John takes. Now here's an extreme position, a famous passage in the book of Enoch. Wisdom went forth to dwell among sons of men. Right? She's all excited to go, go live among people, but she did not find a dwelling. So wisdom returned to her place and sat down among the angels. Well, John doesn't agree with this. <laughs> God's word did come to the world in the Torah, but really came fully and decisively in the man Jesus. And at the end of the passage, he's clearly holding up Jesus as superior to Moses. John 3, the light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Right? So some people will accept God's word. There is some limited success there, but it's not a complete success. Okay, verses 12 and 13, God's word or wisdom is able to make children of God. And again, this sounds like Jesus to a lot of people in this part of the prologue, but yeah, that's because Jesus is just the last stage of the career of God's word. It's going to sound like, it's going to sound like it was earlier, because uh, it's all God's word. But there was an idea in Judaism before this time that God's word could make you a child of God. So right here it says the righteous man who professes to have the knowledge of God, you know, basically somebody who receives God's wisdom boasts that God is his father. In a later chapter, in every generation she passes into holy souls and makes them friends of God and prophets, for God loves nothing so much as the person who lives with wisdom. That's pretty much the same as being a child of God. Blessed shall be the man who trusts in the name of the word of the Lord, we have in the Targum. And, you know, to trust God's word is just to accept God's word. To accept God's word is just to accept and trust 
God himself. You, you trust God by accepting his word. Okay, now we get to the verse that excites everybody when they like to speculate about the subject of incarnation. And here's what's so interesting. Against what James Dunn says, there is, there is an idea of a non-literal incarnation of someone, right, a personification to live with us on the earth. Here's a clear example from Sirach 24. Wisdom, I call it wisdom embooked. All this, that is wisdom, is the book of the covenant of the Most High God, the law that Moses commanded us as an inheritance for the congregation of Jacob. You have a similar passage in that intertestamental book called Baruch. This is our God. He found the whole way to knowledge and gave her to his servant Jacob and to Israel, whom he loved. Afterward, she appeared on earth and lived with humankind. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? She is the book of the commandments of God, the law that endures forever. Now, look, there is no literal lady here, um, and nor is there a literal person who turns into a scroll, because that's nonsense, right? A person can't turn into a scroll. You could destroy a person, and you could create a scroll, but a person, right? It's just not literal. <laughs> Right, the literal minded are going to stumble over this passage. Right? Who you right, who who is this lady who turned into a scroll? Nobody. It's just we're talking about God's word or God's wisdom. And to become embooked or to be the you know the scroll that we now read in the synagogue, that's just to say that his wisdom is expressed in in those writings, right? Okay, well, for God's word to become flesh. And Jesus just means that God's word is, is not only expressed, but kind of fully embodied, fully expressed in the man. What? How can you talk about a man being the incarnation of something like that? Well, um, Philo, who lived in the time of Jesus, wrote that Moses was a living and reasonable law. Right? It's just as if he said, you know, this is an embodiment of the Torah. Okay. It's really not that difficult an idea, this non-literal incarnation business, right? An example I've given before, you know, Thomas Jefferson, his famous house Monticello that he, that he uh, designed. You could say, and then finally one day, his dream of Monticello became brick and mortar, shingles and uh, planks. Well, not really, like a dream, you, you don't live in a dream. A dream doesn't turn into a house on a hill. But we know it's meant, right? His dream became reality, which is to say his plan was finally carried out or expressed in a physical way. Right, and so he uses the word dwell, that we translate dwelt in English or lived, and Craig Keener comments, this is literally tabernacle, which means that as God tabernacled with his people in the wilderness, so as the word tabernacled among his people in Jesus. Right? So in the Old Testament, the glory of the Lord fills the tabernacle. Uh, God you know, appears in the form of a cloud. Here, this interesting passage in 2 Samuel, the word of the Lord comes to the prophet Nathan, go and tell my servant David. Uh, you know, he's scolding David like, you know, for thinking that he gets credit for giving God a place to live. He says, I have not lived in a house since the day I, was, I brought up uh, the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. God, or rather the word of the Lord, is living in a tent or tabernacle among us. Sirach 24, in the holy tent, I, wisdom, ministered before him. Wisdom, uh, seven, chapter 7, uh, again, just expressing the glory of the Almighty. Similar thought, uh, glorious word full of grace and truth. She says, I came forth from the mouth of the Most High like a terebinth. I spread out my branches and my branches are glorious and graceful. Now for the sake of time, I know it's getting late. I'm going to skip over verses 15 uh, through 18 because as best I can tell, there's nothing in them that's going to settle the difference between our four interpretations that I mentioned. Um, I could say something about being before John. I think essentially he's just saying that he's greater in rank than John. But um, yeah, so out of our four families of interpretations, this one seems to be the only one 
which the earliest readers would have discerned in light of things that they had read before. Rightly understood, it doesn't even constitute a difficulty for our understanding of the New Testament. And I think this interpretation has many advantages over its rivals. First of all, it's consistent with the temporal sequence most people see in the prologue, starting with creation. Uh, it's founded on text the original readers probably had access to, making the whole text understandable. We don't need to say there are dark hints or faint shadows of later doctrines here, right? That's a dangerous game to play. How do you know you're not just projecting them onto it? But if you read it in light of contemporary and earlier ideas, that's safe. It's safe against the crime of anachronism, right? And this reading doesn't have any anachronisms. It's all something that a person in the first century could have written and could have thought. Uh, again, this seems to have been held by some ancient mainstream Christians, the ones historians call dynamic monarchians. It's consistent with the Old and New Testament doctrine that only one is involved in creation, God himself, also called Yahweh, also called the Father. And this interpretation that this is the correct understanding of John 1 explains why there was widespread early op opposition to Logos theories to this theory that there's two different ones being called God in that passage. Again, this interpretation is consistent with the other three Gospels, and it fits well together with the seeming fact that Jesus never claimed to have been the direct creator. Right? If it was my hands, so to speak, that put together the heavens and the earth, even if it's God doing it through me, I'm going to take credit for that. But hey, did you hear? God created through me. Like that's a massive accomplishment. I would think that Jesus would claim that if he had done it. As far as we know, he didn't. Again, this view is consistent with the genuine humanity of Jesus. It's consistent with his being a man. Uh, and yes, a, a, a miraculously conceived man. And very importantly, this view is well motivated. All you have to do to come up with this view is to know about this wisdom literature written in Greek and translated into Greek. And then that provides you a way forward to understanding this passage. And the, this uh, reading was not concocted to defend any one theology. This, this view that I've just explained, you can agree with this if you're a Trinitarian, right? You don't think Matthew and Mark and Luke tell you that God created the world through Jesus, right? Right, if you're a Trinitarian. Okay, well, he just John doesn't tell you that either. Maybe Paul does. Okay, so you can accept everything I've said and be a Trinitarian. You can accept everything I've said and be a subordinationist. But as a matter of fact, people are reluctant to do that because it takes away their favorite toy. You know, they, they want to use this to argue for it. But, you know, I think we, want, we need to be honest to the text in its time and place. Notice that my uh, interpretation that I've offered does not depend on any controversial translation or textual critical judgment. Uh, if you think uh, theos ain't halagos in verse one should be translated, the word was divine, fine. Yeah, God's word is divine, it belongs to God. And it's just God, that's fine. Uh, if you think Jesus is called God in verse 18, okay. I mean, that's, that doesn't seem like it fits into the rest of the New Testament, but if you think that's the correct reading, as Jesus points out in John 10, those to whom the word of God came can be called God. So I guess he's just using God in a lesser sense, the term God. Again, this interpretation explains the repeated rediscovery of this sort of reading by leading scholars, whether they're Unitarian, Trinitarian, or Jewish throughout the modern era. So in conclusion, I want to give you an interpretive paraphrase of this text. It's not a translation. Um, it's just a way of expressing what I think the author is saying in my own words. Uh, restating some of its claims in a way to kind of try to reveal the author's thought a little bit more clearly, if that's possible. So th again, this is just the Dale version. You don't, you don't have to like this. You could disagree with this. Again, it's not translation, it's an interpretation. When the world was created, God's word was with him, not that he was someone else. All things came into being through him. Right, we're going to go back to the personifying now. Not a single thing came into being apart from God's word. He was the source of life, a guiding light for all people. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness didn't overcome it. 
God sent a man named John, who came as a witness to testify to that light, so that all might trust in God through his word. John came to testify to the light, but isn't himself the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was yet to come. God's word was in the world, which came into being through him, yet the world didn't know him. He came to his own people, the Jews, but they didn't fully accept him. Of course, he enabled those who received him, trusting him, to become God's children, born of God, not merely of human blood, will, or flesh. Then God's word, so to speak, turned into a man and lived with us, and we've seen his glory that of the unique Son of the Father, one who is full of grace and truth. John the Baptist testified to him, proclaiming, It was about him that I said, The one coming after me surpasses me, because all along he's been greater than me. All of us have benefited from Jesus' fullness, grace on top of grace. God gave us the law through Moses, but now he's given us grace and truth through Jesus the Messiah. You can't see God, but his unique son, who's close to his heart, has shown him to us. And finally, I want to just give the final word to our friend Nathaniel Lardner from the 18th century. And I just love this passage. This is his little postage stamp summary of what John is really up to with this prologue to his gospel. Lardner writes, Jesus came and acted by the authority of of God the Creator and supreme lawgiver of the Jewish people, the eternal word, reason, wisdom, power of God, which is God himself, by which the world had been made, by which he dwelled among the Jews in the tabernacle and the temple, dwelled and resided in Jesus in the fullest manner. This, my friends, is our Lord Jesus Christ, and this text illuminates his greatness in a way which only complements what's written in the first three Gospels. Thank you.